Hi everyone. Today we have uh, Professor Chung Tin Lin, who is going to give a talk on active learning by learning. And this this webinar is actually uh, provided by IEP Computational Intelligence Society. And uh, the next live webinar is going to be on May 20 by Professor Roy Friedman under the under un, under the topic of understanding the complexity of financial system of system. So if anyone is interested, you can register to that uh, webinar. So for today, we have Professor Lin, and thank you very much, Professor Lin, for giving a talk. So I'm gonna give a step to you. Okay, thank you, Sensen, for uh, the introduction. And hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this seminar here. And uh, it's my pleasure to e meet you here. And I'm going to talk about our work on active learning by learning. Although it's a uh, um, pretty um, dated work back to AAAI 2015, I believe uh, many of the ideas are worth sharing with you and can possibly inspire more research on active learning. A little bit more about uh, myself. Okay, I'm a professor at National Taiwan University as um, you just heard from Sinsani. And I'm also a chief data science consultant uh, from APIR, uh, which is a startup company here in Taiwan specializing in making AI easier for um, business applications. And APIR just IPO'd in Japan um, last uh, month. And also I'm the co-author of the Learning from Data textbook, uh, which uh, is an introductory textbook on machine learning and based on the textbook i've offered two uh, massive online open courses on uh, coursera uh, but those are mandarin teaching courses uh, there are machine learning foundations and machine learning techniques okay and i'm going to start by taking uh, one slide from my machine learning techniques uh, mooc and that's need is for building an apple classifier okay let's say we want to do classification and we want the computer to automatically tell us whether uh, it is, um, the picture is a picture of an apple. What we can do here, as you can imagine, is to gather some photos, okay, and label them as apples or non-apples. Okay, here I'm gathering uh, 10 pictures as apples, and maybe I'll gather 10 more as non-apples. I'll label them, okay, um, basically telling the machines that some of these pictures are apples, some of these pictures are non-apples. And then uh, we just use this label data, send it to your favorite machine learning algorithm to get an apple classifier, okay, to tell us whether um, the picture is an apple or not. Okay, that's a typical machine learning um, problem that we can see in the real world. But um, the issue when deploying this kind of uh, procedure into the real world is that labeling can be expensive. Okay, I'm using an apple as an example, so you can, uh, you, you may perhaps think, okay, maybe labeling is not that expensive. Uh, we hire a high school student sitting there and labeling apples, non-apples, that's not super expensive. But there are cases where labeling can be super expensive. For example, in medical applications, okay, where you really need um, very professional doctors to help you do the labeling. Okay, maybe uh, this is a cancerous uh, image, this is a non-cancerous one, and so on. So if you need the doctors to uh, do the labeling for you, then it can be super expensive. And there are other cases where you really, really need uh, money or time to gather your label data. Okay, so basically labeling all your data and then do the machine learning is um, not that possible in this kind of applications where labeling can be expensive. So what should we do? Well, the traditional machine learning approach, we can view it like duck feeding. Okay, we just uh, feed the machine learning algorithm with lots and lots of label training examples to try to get a final hypothesis that is close to the unknown target function that we want to learn. Okay, so this is just duck feeding. Okay, so uh, if we map this to how we teach the students in the classroom, we can say, okay, so this is just giving the students lots of books and notes and slides and everything 
to read, okay, and um, not asking for any feedback from the student. But, okay, in the classroom setting, we may want to help the students learn more efficiently by allowing the students to ask questions. Okay, that's what active learning is about. Okay, so basically, if, okay, we can allow the learning algorithms to ask us some key questions that can fac facilitate the learning performance, okay, then maybe we can do a better learning job. Okay, so uh, active learning is a kind of different learning protocol to communicate with the machines, to communicate with the learning algorithm. What uh, the typical active learning protocol does is to assume that we have another set of unlabeled training examples. These unlabeled training examples um, are also within our data set and the learning algorithm can choose to ask for the label of some chosen example. Okay, so for example, this learning algorithm may have chosen this green apple here and ask, okay, the oracle, the target function, the labeler on whether this is an apple or not. If the learning algorithm gets the information that this green apple is actually an apple, then this label data is added to the label pool to help learning performance. The belief of active learning here is that if, okay, we can allow the machines to get very strategic questions and labels. Okay, for example, in the uh, previous case, the label of this green apple is actually positive one, meaning that it is an apple. If the machine can get the apple, uh, the, the label of the um, desired instance very strategically, then hopefully we will need fewer labels, okay, than the duck feeding algorithm to get better performance. Okay, so each learning algorithm can really decide okay, to um, <coughs> use whatever strategy to improve the learning performance more efficiently. And that's active learning, okay, learning by asking, okay, not just passively sitting there waiting to be fed with data, but um, actively asking for the labels of those data to improve the learning performance. More formally speaking, we will be talking about pool-based active learning algorithm here. And the pool-based learning algorithms assume that we have a labeled pool, okay, first um, um, being there, just like the um, tradition, what the traditional supervised learning algorithm have. Now, we have an additional set of unlabeled pools, okay, much like those uh, green unlabeled uh, apples that we may have previously. So a label pool and a label pool. Okay, the feature part, um, just like the picture here, is going to be named X, okay, as our usual notation, and the label part is going to be named Y. <coughs> now, with both of those tools, we want to design an algorithm, and the algorithm will be iterative in nature, okay, iterative in asking questions. What kind of question do we allow? We allow questions that strategically query some instance, okay, to get the associated uh, label. Okay, so basically there are some instances in the unlabeled pool that the algorithm finds um, most interested in. Okay, so the algorithm would ask this question and then it can get the corresponding label to that example. Then this labeled example is go going to be moved from the unlabeled pool to the labeled pool and then we get a classifier from the label pool. Of course, there are variants uh, of this kind of algorithm. For example, some variants would try to get a classifier from both the unlabeled and labeled pool and so on. Okay. But for simplicity, uh, we will assume that our algorithm is going to learn a classifier from the labeled pool only. What's our goal here? Our goal is to use this particular learning algorithm to try to improve the test accuracy of our classifier with respect to the number of queries as much as possible. Okay, so basically we want to improve it fast. Okay, we want to use as few queries as possible to improve the overall um, test accuracy. That's our goal. We want to design this kind of algorithm. 
And um, our next question is, okay, so it seems that the core of this algorithm is to query strategically. So how can we really query strategically? Well, it's like, as I said, active learning is asking questions. So let's think about how to ask questions strategically. How do uh, our students or ourselves ask questions strategically um, during a class? Or maybe during a webinar, okay? This is hinting you that you can try to think about how to ask me more questions at the end of this webinar. Okay, there's one possible strategy that many people use is to ask the most confused question. Okay. If okay, someone uh, is truly confused by one particular question, then maybe you should ask. Okay, so that's strategy one. Strategy two is maybe to think about, okay, maybe this is the kind of question that most people would think about asking. Okay, so this is the natural question that whenever um, the, the talk or the class goes into this stage, we should uh, ask this kind of question to uh, really confirm our understanding. So this is, this is called the most frequent question. And uh, for strategy three, we may uh, try to ask the most useful question, okay? And this uh, usefulness may uh, refer to um, basically maybe, okay, if we ask this question, this really helps um, improve, okay, the performance in some sense, okay? So there are different strategies. Of course, they are not like disjoint, okay? Maybe they are related. Sometimes the most confused question is also the most helpful one, but maybe not. Okay? So basically, um, we can see there are different kinds of strategies that you can use in the real world to ask, actually ask questions. Now, my question for you, okay, before you really have a question for me, is do you use a fixed strategy in practice? Do you always ask the most confused question or always ask most frequent question or, or, or so on? If you think about it by yourself, Maybe the answer is no, you don't use a fixed strategy in practice. Well, but if you look at the active learning literature, at least at the time we started this research work, we see that each of the strategies we talked about corresponds to some algorithm in the active learning literature. One uh, very important family of algorithms is called uncertainty sampling. And this is basically corresponding to how we human ask the most confused question. And the other strategy is called representative sampling. Okay, so basically sampling the denser part of the unlabeled pool. Okay, so in the unlabeled pool, there are some questions where there are lots of uh, similar questions nearby. And if you ask this kind of question, it is like asking the most frequent question, and it is called representative sampling in the active learning literature. <laughs> and for most helpful, okay, there's a family of algorithms called expected error reduction, which tries to estimate um, the uh, value of each question by seeing how it can help reduce some errors or losses okay, during the training process. Okay, if a question can help reduce the error more, then we view it as a better question, as a more helpful question to ask. So there are three different strategies. Now, we don't use a fixed strategy in practice, but in the active learning literature, every paper previously tried to use a fixed strategy for comparison. So we see this kind of uh, figures. And this kind of figures tells us uh, the relative performance if we choose one single strategy. <coughs> How do we uh, read this kind of figures? Well, there's the horizontal axis, that's the percentage of unlabeled data that we have. And there's the vertical axis, okay, that shows the test accuracy. So the higher, the better. We want the curves to be on the top, okay, so basically uh, trying to um, um, cover all the other curves and so on. Okay. <laughs> In the figure, I'm showing you four different strategies, okay. There's um, the uh, purple, uh, there, there's the, uh, sorry that the color is not so readable, but there's um, the closer to yellow one, that's the random strategy. 
that's not using active learning at all. Okay, just randomly asking a question. And there's the green one that's uncertainty sampling. So that's strategy one. Okay. And there's PSDS and there's choir. Both of them um, refer to some sort of uh, strategy two. Also, basically more representative in nature, while um, some of them uh, are related to strategy three as well. So I'm showing you four different kinds of strategy here. And these three figures, there are three different data sets. Okay, so if you really have uh, uh, trouble showing, uh, reading the details of the lines, no worries. I'm going to tell you the conclusion from these three pictures. First data set, choir, okay, the last um, strategy is the best. It's on the top. That's the purple line. That's the choir algorithm. Okay, so choir is the best. <coughs> data set two, PSDS, okay, is the best. Okay, so you, we can see the blue curve is on the top. Data set three, uncertainty sampling is the best. The green line is on the top. Okay, <coughs> so you see three different data sets three different strategies being the best okay that's one thing the other thing if we look at the blue line okay the the psds algorithm in the center data set is the best in the first and the last data sets it's the worst okay it's even worse than random sampling okay which means not using active learning at all so you see from these three results choosing one single strategy is non-trivial if you believe psds to be the best based on the second experiment you will face um, basically serious degree of performance in the first or the third cases so it is hard okay there are different strategies and as you know uh, each paper claims that its strategy is the best and so on but for practitioners it is very hard to choose one single strategy for their active learning applications. And also those human design strategies, okay, whether it's uncertainty or representative or expected error reduction, they are heuristic in nature. It's just mimicking how we human might to choose to ask questions, okay? It's not a, 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 a gold standard or a theoretically um, strongly justified way of asking questions, okay? It is just uh, trying to mimic how we human do the active learning. So you can also say that, okay, given that the machine is just mimicking human and uh, being confined to one strategy, it, it is really limiting its ability to do better, to do better in active learning. So what we want to do in this work is to try to free the machines. Okay, we want to let the machine use its whole ability. Whole ability to do what? Letting it learn to choose the strategies. So we assume those good strategies are there, human designed and so on, but okay, the machine can freely choose which one to use. So this solves this, the first practical problem, helping humans choose the strategy. And secondly, it um, frees the machine in terms of um, letting it do a better job um, more, more flexibly. Okay, so this is our contribution in this work. Okay, we're doing a philosophical and algorithmic study of active learning, which allows the machines to make intelligent choices of strategies. Okay, so basically, in each round, we want to give the machine um, the ability to choose. Okay. What do I mean here? Well, if you need a real world uh, example to map to, this is like what I want for my kids. Okay, I want to teach my kids something but I also want to teach my kids how to make intelligent choices. Okay, so there are different strategies that you can use, uh, they can use in their life, and I want to teach them how to use the strategies properly. <coughs> and what do I do here? Okay, I am going to design a sound feedback scheme to tell the machine about the goodness of each choice. Okay, so machines make the choices, but I am going to act like a teacher or a parent that gives feedback, okay? And uh, that can tell the machine what to do better in the next round. Okay. So this is just like what I do, okay? In uh, my family, when I interact with my kids, okay? I tell the machine, uh, I tell the kids some feedback, okay? Just like I tell the machine some feedback uh, to how to do better. 
and this results in promising active learning performance okay um, in terms of the machine uh, learning algorithms hopefully just like the bright future of my kids okay that's what i do here in my computational learning lab along with my students okay we want to um, let the machines learn uh, train the machines just like how we would teach our students or our kids and in this talk i'm going to I'm going to tell you uh, the key philosophical ideas behind our proposed approach. Okay, so what do we do here? Okay, we want the um, kids or the machine or the student to try to learn to ask questions. <laughs> and the idea is that uh, learning would not happen without some trials. Okay, so we want, um, design a scheme that uses trial and reward. Okay, Try to ask some questions. Observe whether this question is good or not as the reward and try to improve the question asking strategies. Okay, So basically, we assume we have K strategies initially. What we want the machine to do is first try one strategy. Okay, just pick one. Okay, And then after picking that strategy, we provide the machine with the goodness of the strategy as the reward, okay, for how good this strategy is. And this feedback is going to back to the machines uh, to help it select the next strategy to try. So that's basically our flow. Okay. In each round, you, uh, the machine has K strategies on hand. It tries one strategy and then uses the uh, goodness that we give it as the reward. So there are two issues in designing this algorithm. One is how to try, and uh, the other is how to set a reward function. So let's um, separately look at the two issues. OK, so firstly, how to try. OK, when do humans do this try and reward setting? Okay, that's uh, one thing we ask ourselves. Um, one particular place that we do this try and reward setting is when gambling okay is when you go to a casino okay maybe uh playing <laughs> with uh different tables or different um slot machines and so on okay so um this particular try and reward problem can be cast as another problem of trying the bandit machines okay and a casino so basically in a casino you uh, have k bandit machines if you assume one of them is luckier then the other machines and you want to find the luckier machine in order to get the most reward. Uh, what we can do is to try one betting machine in each round, observe the reward, the monetary return that we get uh, from the betting machine and then use that to refine our strategy until we find the luckier uh, band machine to um, uh, put more, more efforts on try. So that's the bandit setting, and this particular bandit setting is a well-known problem in the machine learning community. And what we do here is to cast our strategy selection problem as the bandit selection problem. And we take one well-known bandit learner that's called exp4.p. Note that this particular bandit learner is probabilistic, and we will use this um, probabilistic nature later when we design the reward function. Okay, but for now, let's just say we uh, reduce, we convert our original uh, strategy selection problem to the bandit selection problem. And after this conversion, we can say, OK, so each strategy just corresponds to uh, one bandit machine. And our problem is to find the luckier bandit machine or the better strategy uh, to put more emphasis on. OK, so we have this okay, bandit strategy. Now, what we do here, okay, we apply the bandit algorithm. So in each round of the bandit algorithm, uh, what we do is let this exp4.p algorithm, the bandit algorithm, decide a strategy to try just like how it decides a bandit machine to try. Then we query the example suggested by the strategy, okay, to compute um, the, the updated classifier. <coughs> After we get the updated classifier, we evaluate its goodness as the reward of the trial. Okay, so we try to, we will show you some reward function that we have designed 
to update the Bandit algorithm. That we call active learning by learning. And this by learning part is the trial and reward feedback using the Bandit learning algorithm. The only remaining problem that we have here is what kind of reward do we want to use okay, for uh, making this algorithm work? Well, before we go into the actual reward function we designed, let's look at the ideal reward function. Okay, What if we can get all resources of the world and design our reward function? Well, the ideal reward function after updating the classifier is actually the test accuracy. The accuracy on the test set, okay? Because remember, test accuracy is all we want. Test accuracy of the classifier is all we want in the active learning setting. If we use the test accuracy as the reward, then the area under the curve that you saw is called the cumulative reward that the algorithm would get. Okay, so basically you see that um, our wish of having a curve that's as high as possible can be translated to having a big area under the query accuracy curve. So we want a, high, a big area. And this um, wish of wanting a big area can be translated to the wish of wanting a big cumulative reward, okay, if we use the test accuracy as a reward. And remember, um, the um, cumulative reward is actually what the bandit algorithm tries to optimize. Okay, if you go to the bandit learning literature, all the bandit learning algorithms try to optimize the uh, cumulative reward. So more ideally, we want to use test accuracy as the reward, but it is infeasible in practice. Okay, you say, okay, can I get a data, uh, test set and use the test accuracy as the reward and so on? But no, why is that? Because Labeling is expensive. For applications that actually need active learning, it usually cannot afford to gather a test set that is sufficiently large to evaluate the, the, the performance. Labeling is expensive. We don't have a super big test set. Okay, uh, otherwise we'll just uh, use this test set, use those labels, part of the labels during training and so on. Labeling is expensive, so we want to use active learning, and therefore we don't have the test uh, accuracy on hand. We cannot use it as an ideal reward. So what we need to do is to approximate the test accuracy. We don't have a test set, we need to approximate it. And also we need to approximate it on the fly, on the fly meaning as we get more and more examples, more and more labeled examples. We need to try to <coughs> approximate the test accuracy. So how do we do? Well, if we look at the examples that we have on hand, maybe uh, the naive replacement of the test accuracy is the training accuracy or the accuracy on the labeled pool. Okay? In each round uh, of active learning, we get some more label data we use this label data, we consider those label data as a labeled um, pool and evaluate the accuracy on this pool. Maybe we can just replace the test accuracy with this training accuracy as a reward and solve our problem. Well, can we guarantee that training accuracy is similar to the test accuracy? If you look at uh, the um, basic machine learning literature, like those discussed uh, in the textbooks that I co-authored, maybe not. Okay, there are several reasons why it is not the case, but I'm going to explain uh, with a simple example here. Okay. If we have an active learning strategy that always asks the easiest questions, okay, the easiest question meaning those questions that the machine has really learned pretty well. Okay, super easy to answer. The machines make very little error on those questions. Then after getting all those examples, the training accuracy is going to be high because those queried examples are super easy to label. <coughs> but the test accuracy is going to be low 
because there's just not not enough information about the harder instances. Okay, the um, um, learning algorithm just try to solve the easiest problem. Okay, but then it cannot do anything about the harder problems. So this creates a huge bias between the training accuracy and the test accuracy. And in that case, the training accuracy will not be a very good estimate of the test accuracy. Okay, so that's um, what we found. Okay, actually, the training accuracy is too biased to approximate the test accuracy, and we somehow need to correct this bias. Okay, to finish our reward design. What do we do? Well, we take another uh, version of the training accuracy instead that we call a tr weighted training accuracy. Okay, basically, we replace the training accuracy with a less biased estimator. <coughs> what do we do here? Okay, traditionally for probabilistic sampling, okay, so if you are sampling from your data set non-uniformly, there is this non-uniform sampling algorithm that basically, basically says you can reweight, okay, your examples with the inverse probability that you do the sampling to get in expectation, okay, a, a similar estimator. Okay, so originally you want to do uniform sampling, but let's say you want to do non-uniform sampling, then you can correct the bias during non-uniform sampling by the inverse probability as weight. <coughs> and we take this concept to design our re reward function. What we do is leverage the probabilistic query in our bandit algorithm. So in our bandit algorithm, it makes probabilistic queries. So each strategy, each example has a certain probability of being queried. We use the inverse of that probability to get a weighted training accuracy. And this weighted training accuracy would be less biased. This weighted training accuracy will be closer to the test accuracy than the previous version. <coughs> so that's our design. Okay, it is a less biased version of the training accuracy that can approximate the test accuracy on the fly. And that weighted training accuracy is the core of our proposed active learning by learning algorithm. So putting um, the bigger picture together, we have a, a, a trial and reward algorithm. And in the trial part, we use exp4.p to decide the strategy to try and to follow the query suggested by the strategy. In the reward part, we evaluate the weighted training accuracy uh, to update the bandit algorithm okay, in order <coughs> to select a better strategy in the next round. Now you may ask, okay, so what you say sounds reasonable, okay, from test accuracy to training accuracy to weighted training accuracy, are there other um, designs of the rewards? After we finished this work, we traced the literature and we, and we actually found uh, one particular approach back in 2004. So this is a very early approach that's called COM. Okay. It also uses a bandit algorithm, but the reward function that it takes is the balancedness okay, of the particular classifier. Okay, so balancedness means okay, you use the classifier to predict on the unlabeled data set and see uh, how many positives, how many negatives, and compute a balancedness score. Okay, the uh, more balanced the classifier, the more reward you give it. This is okay, coming from a domain assumption that if you have um, cases where you have uh, really matching uh, positive and negative examples. Okay, so that's a domain assumption. If you are working on balanced data set, then your classifier should be somewhat balanced. But this is still a heuristic. Okay, and if you want to apply active learning on unbalanced data, which is also uh, some of the application directions, then this assumption may not work. This assumption may not be realistic. So in our view, okay, existing strategies, okay, those single strategies are active learning by acting, acting like what humans do. The COM strategy is also active learning by acting, okay, acting towards a, a, a balanced assumption. And our active learning uh, algorithm is active learning by learning, learning from the feedback 
that comes from the approximate test accuracy using the weighted training accuracy. <coughs> okay, so that's uh, about the um, design of our algorithm. Let's look at some results here. Now I'm showing you again three different data sets. Okay, and in the first data set, the green one, uncertainty sampling, is the best. The second data set, the blue one, PSDS, is the best. The third one, choir, the purple one, is the best. Okay, that's before using the active learning algorithm and when we are comparing random, uncertain, PSDS, and choir. Now we have our active learning by learning algorithm. That's the curve shown in red. Uh, first, okay, uh, similar to the figure that I previously showed you, no single best strategy for every data set. Every data set needs a different strategy. Okay, that's just exactly the message that I tried to tell you in the <laughs> beginning of this talk. And our proposed active learning by learning algorithm consistently matches the best. It may not be easy to be really um, significantly better than the best, but it tries to trace the performance of the best algorithm. Okay, that helps solve the selection problem. Okay, so basically, you have four algorithms there, you don't know how to select. Now, this red curve, this active learning by learning algorithm, helps you select an algorithm such that your performance will be somewhat close to the best one. And this demonstrates that our proposed active learning by learning algorithm is effective in making intelligent choices. <laughs> now, if we compare active learning by learning with the COMP algorithm, um, we see that there are three different curves here. Okay, there's active learning by learning, that's red. There is COMP, okay, that's uh, green. And there's um, another one that's in blue, we'll show later. Let's first check COMP, okay, the green one. Now the red one in the first data set is similar to the COMP algorithm. In the second data set, it's significantly better than the COMP algorithm. And this shows that uh, ALBL is consistently comparable to or better than the COMP one. Okay, and basically demonstrating active learning by learning, the learning performance is more useful than active learning by acting, okay, the uh, COMP performance, the human criterion performance. Um, the other curve that we show in this pic, uh, figures is ALBL train. And this shows that what would happen if we use the training accuracy, the um, non-weighted one as the feedback. We see that because of the, the training accuracy is just too biased, its performance would not be as good as the active learning by uh, learning algorithm. The blue one would be lower okay, in terms of test accuracy. Therefore, this demonstrates our design uh, in terms of importance weighted sampling. Okay, this important weighted mechanism can help us uh, make a better estimate on the performance and therefore do better in terms of the active learning performance. And this is our proposed ALBL. It's effective in utilizing the performance. In summary, I told you the active learning by learning algorithm. It's based on bended learning plus a less biased performance estimator as the uh, reward function. And uh, it's very effective in making intelligent choices. It's comparable to or superior to the best of existing strategies, both single ones, comp, and, and so on. And it's effective in utilizing the learning performance. It's superior to a uh, human criterion-based approach like comp. And we have open source tool developed um, based on this uh, algorithm. And in this algorithm, we implement uh, in this package called libadd, we implemented several famous uh, active learning strategies as well as our active learning by learning algorithm to help people um, develop active learning um, projects more uh, effectively. And normally this should be the end, but I actually want to tell you a little bit more, okay, in terms of deeper discussion about this work. Okay, one, okay, if you are more theoretically inclined in nature, okay, um, I want to have some discussions for you, okay. We use this weighted training accuracy as the reward, but you may ask, okay, you uh, previously, I just say less biased. And is it truly unbiased? Okay, the short answer is, no. No, if you are having this G as a learned algorithm, 
okay? Because during learning, um, because of the model complexity, you would introduce bias, okay? So then this is not a totally unbiased estimator. If you have a fixed G, then yes, okay, this uh, um, uh, weighted training accuracy is unbiased, but for learn, no. Also, uh, you may ask, okay, and typical bandit algorithms, it asks the environment to be somewhat fixed before the um, bandit algorithm makes the choices, okay? That's for a fair game, basically, okay, uh, for, for no room of cheating and so on. But in our design, no, because we have this GT actually learned from the queried examples, okay? This queried examples is used to update, okay, to a new classifier. And we use this new classifier to evaluate the reward. Okay, so basically, <coughs> before playing, the reward is not fixed. After playing, the reward is fixed. So this is, again, violating, okay, the theoretical bandit assumption that um, um, other researchers designed for the bandit algorithm. And also, is the reward independent of each other? Okay, this is particularly needed for some bandit algorithms, okay, that tries to use statistics to uh, estimate the bandit performance and so on. And the short answer is no, okay, because our learned data set contains all the past history and we use this learned data set to um, get G and after getting G, we evaluate the performance. So this reward contains, okay, in a sense, all the past history and it is um, unlikely to be statistically independent. So you can see that our proposed active learning by learning algorithms is, uh, comes from borrowing those tools from theoreticians, but use kind of wild or unintended use, okay? I believe this kind of usage, okay, is not the um, design philosophy, okay, of those particular bandit like exp 4 dp algorithms. But we um, use it wildly, we get some success. Hopefully this leaves some new room for theoreticians to understand why um, ALBL works this way. Okay, and the second part is for practitioners. Okay, you may ask, have we made the active learning um, um, domain more realistic? Okay, when we started developing the package, maybe yes, okay, we, we, we want to do that. Okay, we want to um, educate people that you can actually do active learning more easily and, and so on. And this particular package includes, okay, many <coughs> different strategies and active learning by learning. Actually, we started re this research uh, with the understanding that making choice is not easy for practitioners. And therefore, we want to design an algorithm to help. And this particular package received uh, more than 500 stars on GitHub and continuous issues showing that people really want to use it, okay? So maybe we have made some impact in the community by making active learning more realistic. And that's our design, okay? That's the core of design of layback, okay? We want to make active learning easier for real world users. But, okay, there's always a but, okay? Uh, maybe we haven't achieved all our goals yet. Why not? Because although I say there are many issues, uh, one of the singly most raised issue for um, this package is that it's super hard to install on Windows and Mac. And because several strategies require some C packages, okay? And um, because those C packages are not that easy to be installed on Windows or Mac, our package is also hard to install as well. So we need to solve this kind of issue, telling, uh, giving uh, users more instructions on how to install it and so on. That's the most important issue. Uh, people have less trouble on our strategies on active learning by learning and so on, but they have super uh, big trouble in, in on installing the package. <coughs> and also, excuse me, we um, tried to play with the package in a recent industry product a project and this is the result we get now let's just look at two um curves here one is the um, blue one okay the dark blue one the dark blue one is one particular um active learning strategy that we tried and our albl the active learning by learning algorithm is the light blue one that's in the middle And there's another curve that you can see the dark green one. That's uncertainty sampling. 
what we observe from this industry project is that uncertainty sampling often suffices. Okay, you need you don't need to run many things more. You just use a default choice of uncertainty sampling, and it usually does well. And our proposed active learning by learning algorithm, it's dragged down by a bad strategy. In this case, the DWUS strategy that we tried. Okay, and our proposed active learning by learning algorithm, it can try to trace the best performance, but still it could be affected by a super bad strategy as well. Therefore, it shows that active learning by learning may not be as useful as we have imagined. So in conclusion, Libac is a Python package designed to make active learning easier, but we are still on the way of trying to make it actually easier for real world users. Our lab has some other attempts for realistic active learning. I'm going to quickly uh, flash through them here in case you're interested. One is to learn a strategy beforehand rather than on the fly. And we studied how to transfer the active learning um, experience from um, other learning tasks. But it is not easy to realize it in open source packages. And we have studied um, the use of active learning on other tasks like NLP or reinforcement learning or um, variations of the active learning task, like being annotation cost sensitive or classification error cost sensitive. Okay, those are some of the works that we have done. And we're still trying to um, satisfy more real world needs um, um, in, in terms of active learning. And if you have interested problems, I'm, um, uh, I, I welcome you to send me an email and we can discuss some uh, possibilities in the active learning domain. Okay, finally, uh, really the last page. Okay, um, I've been doing active learning research for um, quite a few years now, and there are lessons learned along the way. One is uh, when doing active learning by learning, um, we see the scalability bottleneck of artificial intelligence actually is on making choices. Okay, people have difficulty making choices, machines have difficulty making choices as well, and that's our. Um, uh, motivation of designing the active learning by learning algorithm. Basically, try to help make better choices. And when designing the algorithm, it may be important to think outside of the math box. Okay, there are non-rigorous usage okay, of the math tools that may be good enough in terms of algorithm design. And it may inspire future study, future math studies on why it works. And um, in terms of the LibAct package, okay, we learned that um, easy to use in design, in designing the package and so on, doesn't mean easy to use in reality, okay, much like uh, how we have the install issues in LibAct. And there's a long way on how to really put those algorithms to um, practical use, to realistic scenarios, whether for open source or for industry projects. Okay, that's all I wanted to um, tell you today. Thank you so much for your attention and I welcome any questions that you may have regarding my talk regarding active learning. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Professor Lin. Uh, if any one of you has any question, you can type in the question box and then I will transfer that question to Professor Lin. Um, I don't see a first question yet. So, um, my question is that um, you use a reward in the learning, right? So, what mm -hmm. what about if we adding a punishment in the learning? Also, will that help? Um, yes, that's a super interesting question. Uh, we actually thought about that. Okay, in terms of how do we do the uh, punishment? For example, um, if um, many strategies have uh, similar questions or very dissimilar questions. How do we leverage uh, jointly among the uh, different strategies to design the punishment function? Uh, in the end, we didn't have the uh, resource to execute the whole idea, so uh, we didn't continue on that. But uh, actually, this is a very important issue because after our work, people have tried to um, basically use this active learning by learning idea 
uh, along with different tools, like uh, not just Bandit, but also more complicated uh, reinforcement learning tools. And I actually believe in the reinforcement learning tools, there's a wider room in terms of injecting the punishment idea okay, into that to uh, facilitate uh, active learning. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, next question is that, did you use LBLN with a neural network? Okay, uh, I assume you mean uh, ALB also, that's active learning by learning. Okay, did, and did we use that with neural networks? Actually, um, our library um, is coupled with uh, scikit-learn. So uh, any uh, learning model that can be used in scikit-learn can be coupled with libact. Okay. But uh, when the paper was published, uh, no, at that time we didn't uh, try neural network and deep learning, but technically we can do that. Um, on the other okay. hand, I want to highlight uh, with our latest work in natural language processing, we did try active learning with um, deep learning with neural networks. And we find that there mm -hmm. are um, some more interesting issues there because in deep learning or neural networks, active learning not just need to um, get the labels that helps uh, classification the most. It also needs to get the labels that may help feature extraction the most. Actually, that's the conclusion of mm -hmm. our NLP work, basically trying to say, okay, with the NLP, we have some very good pre-trained models like BERT and so on. We should leverage those models um, to estimate the, um, the ability of the active learner in terms of improving the um, feature extraction performance. Okay, So I believe there's oh. a whole wider area of studying active learning for deep learning, uh, for how to uh, query the examples that best help uh, feature extraction or feature condensing. Mm, okay. Uh, next question is that he said that, uh, thank you for your great presentation. How many strategies K did you use in ALBL when you compare it with other purely strategies? Did you also vary K? Okay, that's, uh, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. In our experiments, okay, when we started the paper, we used like four to six strategies, if I recall correctly. Um, basically, uh, at that time, we played with uh, some parts, and if the strategies are like uh, less than 10, uh, roughly, okay, ALBO seems to be working well, okay, but uh, typically for bandit algorithms, indeed, if there are too many choices and mm. if okay, you don't model the correlation between different choices, then it would take the bandit algorithm more time mm. in terms of exploration and that can be problematic. So that's part of the issue we try to uh, um, improve okay, with ALBL and uh, also uh, layback in Ooh, future years. Okay, okay basically, so, I mean, how to who scale this up with what is the good for K value, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to scale it up with bigger K and uh, knowing the limitation of okay. ALBL to bigger K. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Oh, I don't have any more question. Um, is there any more question from you guys? Okay, I think I think we sh um I think there is no more question. If any any one of you has any question, you can send an email to Professor Lin directly, and yes, he can yes, answer. Yes, I welcome emails. Oh, question too. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, Professor Lin, and thank you so much for all the audience who come to listen to this webinar. So uh, I will see you for the next webinar in May. So thank you so much. I'm just going to end the the, uh, the webinar right here. Okay, thank Goodbye. you, Jenny. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Goodbye. Um, I'm just going to end it here. Bye. Bye-bye. Uh...